everyone Dennis Chang here welcome to yet another video so today what I want to talk to you about was uh, the early 30s style of guitar playing and more specifically the accompaniment style of that era but before we start as always this uh, online thing is my main source of income and of course this YouTube video is done for free and what would help a lot is if you could like, comment, subscribe, share, hit the bell notification. Um, and if you want to support me, you can maybe buy something on DC Music School, on SoundSlice. I have Gypsy Jazz courses, Bebop courses, and even on my SoundSlice page, you'll find a lot of uh, rare transcriptions for free. So, Or you can also buy something on Bandcamp. But anyway, let's get started. Leave a comment. Um, yes, the early 30s. So it's one of my main areas of interest not the early 30s but just the 30s in general as i said in a previous video the reason why i'm interested in this is because there's not a lot of detailed information out there and this is kind of like an archaeological research that we all those of us who are interested in this stuff have to do on our own by listening to the music and sharing our observations and my hope is that some of you will get interested enough and try to do this same kind of archaeological research and then share your knowledge with me uh, maybe I get I get some certain things wrong because we can only rely on our ears. Um, I do also read a lot of uh, books, any book that I can find, articles and all that stuff from that era. So one thing to note is that in the early 30s, music in general was in a phase of uh, technological transition. A lot of things weren't standardized yet. Um, in the early days a lot of guitar players were playing banjo or maybe tenor guitar so that's a different sound and if a guitar was used of course you would hear these kinds of rhythms the four to the bar rhythm but there was there is one specific style of accompaniment that i heard players like um eddie lang and all the the other players, I'm very bad with names, like beyond the famous people, what, what were the names? Well, the guitar players that played with uh, Eddie Lang, uh, Carl Kress, uh, yeah, forget it, I, I'm bad with names. <laughs> I'm bad with recognizing people too. But what was I going to say? So there's this style of accompaniment that's less like this, but more something like this. And you hear Eddie Lang do this a lot, um, other players as well. And actually, there's a funny story. One thing that got me, one of the things that got me interested in this style of early guitar playing was a movie, a horror movie called Insidious. And in that movie, there's this scene that's really, really creepy. And you hear this really old song. And I, I was a little bit intrigued. And that song turned out to be Tiptoe Through the Tulips. And it was a song... I don't know if he wrote it, but at least it was popularized by one of the first early jazz guitar players, Nick Lucas. And so I watched uh, videos of him and then I started checking out recordings of early jazz guitar players, like uh, not just jazz guitar, but just guitar players in general. In, in general. So you have people like Lonnie Johnson, Eddie Lang, uh, all that. And I noticed a number of things that they were really, really good guitar players with really powerful techniques. So we're going to talk about a few things here. Um, what you just heard in the beginning was one of the solos that Nick Lucas liked to play. It was a, I think it was a composed solo because he, he recorded many times and it was almost always the same solo with little tiny variations here and there. So I'm, I play the same solo with my little modifications here and there just to, I guess, suit my technique a little bit better. And so let's just talk about this accompaniment style. It's uh, very, what was very interesting to me was to notice how 
much they seem to care about voice leading in those days. Whereas today, you know, like you look at a chart and it says B flat and you take whatever like B flat major seven, like stock chord. And there we go. But back in the day, when I look at the videos, there are not many of uh, early jazz guitar players. The accompaniment is almost like uh, an orchestra. Like if you watch uh, Nick's video, like you would do things like this. You would notice all these kind of close grips, chord voicings that where the hand is not moving so, so much like this, like this, like that. But you have voice leading. Ah, B flat, F7. Like that. And it's like each, each chord, like, like I said, each chord is carefully chosen and the notes within the chord are carefully um, manipulated through voice leading. And I noticed that, for example, Django Reinhardt had that quality as well. So that was super interesting. And you would have all these like interesting um, voice leading techniques that are done, that were done on the guitar that almost, that reminds me of an orchestra, like a piano. So that was very, very cool. And then the next thing that uh, intrigued me was the right hand technique. How powerful they were back in the day, because I guess they had no choice. Um, as I've said in previous videos, this is a technique today that people call the gypsy jazz technique, gypsy picking. And that's because of a book written by uh, Michael Horowitz. And it's a great book. But the truth is that this is the, this is the technique that was used back in the day. And I, it's a centuries old technique. It has this specific sound. As opposed to modern technique or what have you. And by adopting this technique, you tend to, well, they tended to favor downstrokes maybe because it would get, you would get more projection. With this technique, it's not that it's necessarily louder because you can play loud with uh, any technique. But I would say that it's easier to play louder with this technique just because of the way the, the right hand is positioned. I do have a Gypsy Jazz guitar technique course on DC Music School. You can check that out if you want. But yeah, I noticed that they, in those days, they really took advantage of this technique and it's just a, a very powerful sound. Whereas today, there are some players who play gypsy jazz, there are many players who play gypsy jazz who use this technique, but do not take advantage of the, the explosive power that you can get from using the technique. One of the reasons mainly being because nowadays we can amplify our instruments, whereas back in the day, it was not as easy to amplify. So therefore, you really had to put an effort to have this attack. <laughs> as opposed to like how someone might use this technique but play very softly see and one thing that I, i've said this in previous videos one thing that i do with technique is when i grab an instrument an acoustic instrument i listen for different sounds hmm. doesn't sound right here it sounds right So that was also one of my main takeaways from watching or watching videos or listening to recordings from that era. Anyway, let me teach you this little ditty, this Nick Lucas thing. You can find it on SoundSlice, the transcription. But um, if you watch videos of Nick Lucas playing it, you'll notice how like he uses quite a lot of downstrokes. I didn't copy copy exactly what I what he did. I just did things the way I felt felt it would sound nice in terms of like whether I do a downstroke or an upstroke. But it starts with this little intro and I just do downstrokes. And I do down here. And here I do a double down. 
because I want this to be, this is a downbeat here. And this will be, I do a down, but then I put an accent on this. That's what I did. I don't know what Nick did, but I think he did something similar. And then what else did, so. And then I put a little accent. B flat, so F, uh, D7 or F sharp diminished if you want to call it. And here, they do G minor 6. He does G minor 6 as opposed to G minor 7. If you watch my previous video, I talked about the difference between minor 7 and minor 6 in the 30s. So, yeah, check that video out. Then it goes to E7. A minor. And then F, B flat. And you, Nick liked to adopt this position for B flat chords. Or not B flat, but like in fifth string with the root on the fifth string, you just put his thumb like this. And a lot of guitar players did that as well. I've seen videos of people playing D minor like this. Anyway, B flat, B flat minor, same. Then, ah, yeah, C7. So what's interesting, okay, D7, then this G minor 6 chord, but it's actually a C7. See his grip doing this, and you have this little thing which is all downstrokes. And this is something Stokolo Rosenberg is very famous for this technique down, down, down. So, so, ah. and then you have this triplet run. really cool uh, what does it go after it's that same thing and this is interesting Nick uh, in the video does this progression and you kind of hear like a triplet in the attack it's very hard to see because the, the the video quality and the audio quality was not so good but what's but what's interesting is that well it represents this chord progression F over A A flat diminished G minor 6 F sharp diminished or D7 back to G minor. But he did it like this. I think he played only two notes with a thumb. But you hear like a taka taka taka. So I'm just doing this. It's X notes. So. Then. Uh, and then this thing. F. E. A minor, C7, F. And that's the whole thing. So check out the transcription on Sound Slice and have fun learning it. It's not it's actually not very easy to play uh, with that same sound and that same uh, intent. But uh, I hope this gets you a little bit curious into checking out a lot of these players from the old days. There we go. Leave a like comment, subscribe, blah, blah, blah. Thank you so much.